Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. Um, we're deep in the throes of quarantine. I think it's been, like, almost a year, which is freaking crazy, and, like, I never want to go back to the real world again. Like, I do. I don't want people to be dying and, like, at risk. You know, I had COVID myself, um, but I was, like, about to just put on makeup for this podcast, and then Jason was like, no, you don't need to, and I was like, you're right, because who fucking cares? I mean, I pretty much only wear makeup now for this podcast or like on the off chance that I'm going out and doing something of note which has not really happened um plus not that many people are even gonna watch this so who cares um and then I was even like gonna put on like a nicer top and whatever and I was also just like who cares we're here for books this is not a makeup tutorial channel um if you want to see my makeup favorites comment below just kidding it's gonna be like we got weird vibes today. Um, it's a Sunday. It's like 2.30, 2.45. I just, Sundays, I pretty much just live for 90 Day Fiance, which is on at 5 p.m. PST. Everything else is usually pretty uh, non-substantial. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to Target and do like a couple quick errands. Um, but, you know, that's not important. Um, my hair is also wet because I just took a shower and you don't care. Um, what else is new? I mean, the country is falling apart again. Surprise. Um, this is not a political podcast by any means. I don't know. Um, what do you guys want to see more of? What do you, I am slowly starting to like amass a little bit more of a following. So if you're new here, hi. Um, <laughs> I read, um, five to six books a week and usually most of them make the podcast. Um, sometimes I read more and they don't because they are not worthy of note of talking about, but I still, um, check out my Goodreads, follow me on Goodreads so you can see everything I'm reading in real time and rating and, uh, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter. Um, Twitter's probably like the most fun. You get like the the weirdest off the cuff hot takes. Like if you're into this kind of energy, definitely follow me on Twitter. Um, all that will be linked down below. I think Twitter's the only one that I'm like hesitant to merge uh, with the podcast or like have a separate one. Like I have a separate Facebook page. Also follow that. I have a separate Goodreads. I just changed to I like to read because that is pretty, you know, Goodreads, please sponsor me. I love you. Goodreads, favorite social media. Um, and I have a separate Instagram and Twitter. I'm like, that just feels like too much. Like, I'm just going to, you know, hashtag I like to read. But uh, we don't need to, like, freaking have a whole separate thing because, like I said, that one's pretty much the most just, like, random off the cuff. Anyways, so what are we here to talk about? Um, today, our first book is Burn Our Bodies Down by Rory Power. Um, so this is definitely a young adult novel um definitely darker definitely a little bit um more provocative than some other you know more fantasy-esque lighter ones um young adult is like a whole diatribe i'd love to like have a young adult author on here and talk about the genre um because it was of course very <laughs> formative even from a much younger age than i was appropriate to reading at like nine i was reading about like high schoolers having sex i mean that probably explains a lot psychologically um but burn our bodies down is like the kind of book that i probably would have loved at 16 and still loved today at 26 i was like how old am i i'm 26 for about one more month birthday is february 12th any listeners y'all know i would love like an amazon gift card or whatever just kidding i don't need anything from you um but actually not just kidding you know, maybe i'll you can email me whatever it's fine uh, <laughs> so margo um is in a very you can tell right from we kind of begin in media res of her very um strange relationship with her mom her mom is clearly you know some sort of one step away from negligent Margot is a young woman who's like tried her best to be independent and raise herself uh, but her mother also has this mysterious like family background and at one point Margot kind of is just like you know what I've had enough with just me and my mom like this is I don't even know how I mean uh, my parents were divorced but equally involved in my life and so if I just had to deal with like one of them full time and didn't even have any siblings or anything to detract from that which I do hey Emily if you're listening um that would be hard and that would be a lot so naturally I mean she gets fed up she wants more family so she goes in search um of her grandmother and who lives on this historic farm in a um like at a southern town and so through there um weirdness ensues there's definitely like a sort of Fant not fantasy, but like surreal element 
to Margot's family. I don't want to give too much away um, to her family, to her grandmother, um, to her mother, sort of where they came from and why their family is so weird. Margot herself is really awesome because she's got that brave badassness, but also um, Rory Power, the author, <laughs> recognizes, of course, as a character that she is only 16. Uh, she is a very young girl. I mean, much more headstrong and independent and amazing than I would have been at that age, um, but still has those, in, you know, that roller coaster of emotions and that impulse making and you're not a full adult i mean even at 26 i don't feel like an adult um so she has to deal with some very adult things and make some very adult choices um and kind of just decide what life she wants to live there's definitely some stephen king like horror it's definitely you know there's like a little bit of horror fantasy in it um which i think you know enhances the novel it's not just like a sort of like her mother abused her and that's you know it's definitely got more layers to it um and so, like I said, even though I think it is technically classified as young adult, I think, uh, I'm also sorry, we have, po I have pockets in my shorts, so I might just be like sticking my hand in there. Um, so, yeah, family trees and the roots of our family trees and the lands on which we come from and uh, how much that influences and is part of our lives. I mean, there's a little bit of that, like, Southern, you know, I think he did it, but I just can't prove it. She did, whatever. Uh, like, you know, nobody, no crime vibes. Um, so if we have, maybe we'll classify all the books in uh, this episode as an album from Evermore. So Burn Our Bodies Down is, I mean, the title freaking says it, but definitely nobody, no crime. Okay. Um... Next, we have Recollections of My Non-Existence, a memoir by Rebecca Solnit. Um, it's always wonderful to read a memoir about someone who has come so far and is like a little bit older. I mean, I, I read a fair amount of memoirs of people who are around my age, you know, young adult millennials who have overcome something or gone through something in the midst of it, but still have quite a long way to go with their journey and are sort of, this is their first opening thing. And so Re Rebecca Solnit, she is a... Um, she's a writer and she's a poet and an author and someone who had never been on my radar but is in her 60s or 70s I believe and then Recollections of My Non-Existence is a beautiful memoir about her um, as a young woman becoming an author and so when I uh, her becoming an artist and becoming a writer and so when I first started reading it um, again I just saw this recommended somewhere so I didn't really know much about her and I kind of thought again even there's a young woman on the cover so I was like oh this is about you know like a 30 something year old who's just making it and then she's going to live her life but it's actually like her really the recollections looking back on her life um she grew up as a young woman in san francisco during the the aids crisis and during the 70s and the 80s so that's like a fascinating cultural background that she really delves into and immerses herself into that comes alive on the page um there's also she just talks a lot about the the being um the essence of being a woman and the violence um whether overt or um, sort of more subtle that is impacted on women, especially uh, not that it's not continuing now, of course, but as um, a defenseless, you know, younger woman living alone in San Francisco in a city. Um, what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean? Um, also, she was surrounded by a lot of different gay men because um, she lived near the Castro district. Um, so uh, she definitely explores a little bit about like gender versus sex uh, versus like, you know, biological sex. And how all these people like taught her how to write and so it's you know sort of a an autobiography but in a memoir sense and in a way you know that's kind of at what point is an autobiography a memoir about i guess a memoir is more about like a specific period an autobiography typically would span like one's entire life or like up to that point um but it feels very you know recollections and she's remembering these things and reminiscing on them and of course you know they're tinted by her memory and the, the way she remembers them. Um, so it's colored a little bit, you know, with whatever's happened in the past 40 years to bring her to that memory. Um, but it's really just beautiful and poetic, even though it's written in prose and written as a memoir novel. I always say everything, memoir book, not a novel's mean fiction. Not everything is a novel. I'm just so used to saying that. Because I think faster than I speak, or I speak faster than I think. Um, so, Recollections of My Non-Existence, I think if we had to compare that to a song on Evermore, first, you know, I should, like, pull up the Evermore songs, because I know most of them, I literally was just listening to it, but to, like, get um, the titles down, just so I can make sure I don't forget it. Um, 
maybe like Marjorie or Dorothea just because Rebecca is an older woman who's sort of passing down her advice and uh, I don't even know you know a more seasoned woman who's passing down her advice and passing down her experience as a younger woman um, and continuing to live her life and do that so um, and inspiring you know me and hopefully lots of other women and just people who are reading her work so we'll go with Marjorie or Dorothea. Um, and then next we have In an Instant by Susan Suzanne Redfern. Um, and before I talk about this one, this one is on Kindle Unlimited um, right now at the time of recording and release. So you can actually get it um, either for free if you're a member of Kindle Unlimited or I think you can get it for like $5 on Kindle. Um, so definitely a more affordable one if finances are ever uh, deterrent to reading a book, although they never should be because you should explore your local library, um, whether online or in person. Um, in an instant seemed like a little bit cheesy when I first started reading it and then I just like really got sucked in. It was sort of like a little bit of like a Nicholas Sparksy, you know, tragedy and how we learn from it dealt with the schmaltziness and like even though it starts out with something bad, like you know everything's gonna be okay. Um, but in an instant is about so Finn is a young girl, she's about 16. Um, she dies in an accident, that's not a secret, um, with her family. Um, and then the rest of the novel, this one is actually a novel, actually fiction, um, is told from her perspective as someone who has just passed away but is still not like passed on. And so she's observing the rest of her family and the people in the accident um, through this sort of like unbiased, you know, ghost spirit perspective. Um, and so the accident involves her family, her friend, um, her best friend, and her aunt and uncle and cousin, uh, or family friends who are called uncles and uncles. And this is in, this is a very traumatic accident. Um, two people die, inc or including Finn. Um, multiple people are injured. So it's just, of course, the ramifications of trauma, of dealing with this accident. Um, Finn's death was caused directly as a result of the accident, but her brother um, does pass away. And I won't give away the details of that, but there is some sort of question um, behind the circumstances of his death that pits some people in the accident against each other. Um, and it's by no means like a thriller or, you know, there's a little bit of that sort of, you know, like, will he, will they or won't they, you know, come to justice for his death? But it's really just about sort of moving on and tragedy and how we can absorb grief into our daily lives while still moving forward with our lives. Um, I definitely believe in some sort of, you know, higher power or, uh, you know, heaven and some sort of, you know, we don't know what happens when you die. I believe that something happens. I definitely believe in the fact that there are like spirits and other presences around. Do I believe in like, you know, ghosts, ghosts? I don't know, but I think there are a lot of things that can't really be explained. And so maybe there's some weird sort of scientific phenomenon, but I think it's kind of fun to believe in ghosts a little bit. Um, but it's not really a ghost novel. It's really just about, uh, you know, how we are haunted by that metaphorical spirit. Um, I can't imagine being in an accident as tragic as this one where, you know, whether or not you survived, you still have, you know, that survivor's guilt or you'll take the lingering effects and how the different members of the family move on um, and process the accident is really just beautiful and how each one is given their own story and their own time to really be developed and explored in three dimensional. And even though it's a heavier, you know, darker subject, again, it's ultimately sort of that like lifting up from the darkness and into the light. And there's like a little bit of like spiritual stuff in it, which was like a little bit too much for me, like a little bit too much like God and like the higher power. I'd like to stick to more of just like a karmic spiritual vibe, but it didn't bother me. It wasn't like an overt like Christian, this is God, Jesus novel, which I'm definitely not about. I mean, if no shame to anybody who is not, that's just not my thing. So if we had to compare in an instant to a song from Evermore, I think what we would do, um, I think happiness, you know, there was happiness because of you and there'll be happiness after you, like remembering the wonder and the joy that Finn and Oz brought um, to this family's life and recognizing it and not, you know, living with it, not shoving it aside, not ignoring it, not continuing to dwell in it, but this is a part of you and the happiness that was brought from, and I guess we could also do closure too, that would work too. So maybe closure or happiness. Um, and next we have High School by Tegan and Sarah Quinn. Uh, you might recognize those names because Tegan and Sarah are a super dope uh, rock duo. I mean, they're, they're sisters who have a 
group. Um, I really, I mean, I want to say they're super awesome. I mean, I only know a few of their songs. I'm only, from, you know, uh, Walking with a Ghost, I think is like the most famous one that I know. Um, but I definitely want to get more into their music after reading this. High School is all about growing up in the 90s. It's their memoir. It's their story about how as really young, like 14, 15 year old girls, they freaking started their own group, started writing their own songs, made a name and a scene for themselves in the Canada music scene. And then um, through that, like came to the US and grew and became super big. And it's filled with just like the grungy young teenagers in the 90s. Like I was born right in the 90s. So I sort of like nostalgicized this fantasy for myself since I was only like a young kid then I wasn't really like a teenager, but to like see Kurt Cobain and see Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all these like cool groups that are kind of like, you know, defying the norms and like creating their own sound that's a little more punk, but like a little more rock. Um, it's just very formative for them, not only in terms of their music career, but also in terms of discovering their sexuality. Um, both of them are out um, lesbians, and but both of them came to their own realizations of that in vastly different ways, although both at a young age in high school. Um, it's written in dual perspectives um, with Tegan and with Sarah, so you really get to know them, even though they're identical twins, like as very distinct individual people. And it's fascinating because, you know, they go through a lot of the same experiences and to see those experiences through the eyes of the other people. So you get to see like both accounts of what happened um, and just, you know, the origin of a wonderful female based rock group that is still around today. Um, so I think this book came out about a year ago. No, it's 2021. It came out in September 2019. So it's been over a year. Um, but if you're into rock and roll memoirs, girl group, you no, know, just any kind of group, like band origins, but also just coming of age, high school novels. I mean, it's a coming of age novel that's great regardless. And then the fact that they became a super successful band and how they navigated that and did all that really like on their own with pretty, you know, no real distinct advantages financially or connections or anything, just sheer talent. Um, so high school, I think we definitely have to compare to, I say definitely, like I know what the answer is. Um, I say, this is like a hard one. Maybe like Willow because they're definitely like, you know, witchy, not witchy, but like they got their, um, I come back stronger than a 90s trend. That's why, because they're a 90s trend, but they're stronger than that and they're still going strong. So we're going to compare high school to Willow. Um, well, this was a weird last minute decision, right? But maybe we should do this for other, let me know if you like this weird, like comparing the books to albums from a song or movies, or we could do something weird. Um, and the last book that we have, last but not least, is The Appointment by Katrina, Katarina Volkmer. Um, this is definitely, I think it could be classified a novella. Again, maybe it's like 100 pages is the limit, but it's about 144 pages, so it's very easy to read. Um, it is told literally as a stream of consciousness monologue um, from a young woman or middle-aged woman, I guess. I keep saying everyone's a young woman, and that could really be anything. Uh, speaking of young woman, Promising Young Woman, fantastic, fantastic film is out on VOD at the time of this releasing. Uh, Maybe I'll talk about it more in the next episode because we're almost done with this last book and I got to go to Target. But a uh, promising young woman. Fantastic. Um, so it's about more struggles of sexuality and identity. Um, the young woman in this, uh, the middle-aged woman who is, so it's all just about her. She's in a appointment with her therapist, Dr. Seligman. Um, and it was, she's been born, she was born in Germany. She's then lived in London. Um, and she's just kind of, feels like she's got a lot of weird like Hitler Nazi centered fantasies um she's got you know overbearing mothers and this the death of her grandfather um which led to a windfall inheritance so she's got like a lot of things catalysts happening in her life but the biggest thing that she wants to explore is her notion of gender and her notion of sexuality. Um, and I don't think she really necessarily identifies as like a trans woman, but sort of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man and how we can switch between those identities. It's a very like visceral, cerebral book. So it's definitely not for everybody. But if you're into exploring a train of mind, um, the train of mind or <laughs> train of thought and the mind of one specific character who is extremely well developed and we get to see the world through their eyes if you're into sort of that more like theatrical play format because while it is 
you know, a monologue format, it's still 144 pages. Like, there's no way you're going to want to go see anybody just, like, read that on stage. It's an audiobook, basically. Um, but as Goodreads says, the appointment is an audacious debut novel, so I guess full novel, um, by an explosive new international literary voice, challenging all of our notions of what is fluid and what is fixed, and the myriad ways we seek to make peace with others and ourselves in the 21st century. And that, my friends, is the appointment. Oh, we have to compare it to a book. I mean, a song from uh, Evermore. Uh, I lost the tab. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, I think... Maybe tolerate it because it's like she... The main character, like is tolerating her sexuality and stuff, but she wants other people to really accept it and feel comfortable in the world. And she's like been okay with everything now and tolerating it, but she really wants to like embrace it and love it. So with that, I hope you are having an okay 2021. You know, I don't wanna say great, that puts the pressure up really high, but as long as you're doing okay and hanging in and stay reading, I will catch you next time. Bye.